big part of total fitness is relational fitness. And in relational fitness, a huge area is occupied by family and friends. What role do family and friends have in my life and what's my impact on their lives? That's what we want to think about today in light of God's Word, especially in light of the book of Proverbs. When we think about this, um, one thing to ask about, I've got a problem here. Um, oh, no battery, I think, but maybe not. Maybe there's a, uh, I don't think it's a battery. Whatever it is, I'm clicking and it's not happening. What, do you, somebody want to grab this or? Okay. In the meantime, um, you guys run it and we'll keep on going. A big part of that is just evaluating then um, your friendships as well as your family and the impact they have on you and you on them. Is your family helping or harming you? Are they making you better or worse? That may sound like a strange question to ask when one of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother, but you really do need to ask, is my family good for me or bad for me? Because sometimes family is bad for you. And you have to ask the impact that you have on your family? Um, am I having a bad impact on my kids if you're a parent? Am I having a bad impact on my brothers or sisters? And so on. So we need to ask about that. And the impact of, of a husband and wife on each other is very important. The Bible says an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. So that's quite a contrast. One kind of wife is like a crown, and the other one makes you feel like your bones are rotting away. And, so the, and obviously the same could be said of a husband. He can be a great blessing and crown for his wife, and he can make her life miserable if he's the wrong kind of husband. And when you read the Bible, you see some examples of that. Um, to mention just a few, uh, a woman of noble character or an excellent wife is a title that's used in various places. And when you read the book of Ruth, you see that she's described as a woman of noble character. And who describes her that way? Well, her husband-to-be, Boaz. And those two um, see the Lord at work in each other and their lives are blessed. And, and they come together as husband and wife. And eventually the great King David comes from their line. But you can also have a husband and wife who have a negative impact on each other. And you have um, them leading each other into becoming worse and worse. A couple of examples of that. You read that Ahab, a king of Israel, was the worst king Israel ever had. And he really didn't need much help. He was a rotter himself. But it says he was the worst king Israel ever had, egged on by his wife Jezebel who was a horrible, horrible, wicked woman. So Ahab, in a sense, didn't need much help being wicked, but he had plenty of it because she was wicked too. So sometimes you have a husband and wife who are on the same page, and it's a really bad page. So you have to evaluate that. Or in the New Testament, you have Ananias and Sapphira. What a harmonious marriage they had. They agreed perfectly on how they would relate to the church. They would lie to the church. They would lie to the church about how much money they gave and they ended up dying because of it. So you can have examples of a husband and wife who make each other worse and worse and worse. And you can also have examples of a husband and wife who help each other to become better and better and better. When we read about the wife of noble character or the excellent wife, Proverbs 31 says, an excellent wife who can find she's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She makes his life better. And so a spouse can have a huge impact on your life, for better or for worse. That's why it's so important to pick a good one. Marry a person who is going to make your faith stronger and stronger. Marry somebody who has the kind of faith that you want your kids to have, because that's a fairly likely outcome. So when you know the impact of a spouse, choose them wisely, and then once you have one, by God's help, help them to become a better and better person and keep evaluating 
the impact that they might be having on you so that if you did marry somebody who's not always healthy for you, you have the Lord's help uh, to deal with that kind of impact and instead have a positive influence on them. Take Job, for example. Job was a great and righteous man, but when trouble came into his life, his wife wasn't there to help him. She said, curse God and die. He says, well, you're talking like a foolish woman. Uh, we, should we accept good things from God and not trouble? And so rather than him being drawn down into her unbelief, he helped to lift her back out of it. And so we need to understand the impact of spouse in our life. Um, the Bible says that marriage is a portrait. And when we think of a marriage portrait, we often think of those pictures that were taken on a wedding day by an extremely expensive photographer so that you could have your wedding preserved for the rest of your life and have a portrait of it. But when I'm talking about a wedding portrait or a marriage portrait here, marriage is a portrait of something very amazing and mysterious. It's a portrait of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. The Bible says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So a husband is called to give himself up for his wife and a wife to submit to her husband. There's a sacrifice on both of their part for the other so that they can be a portrait, a portrait of Christ and his church. And that's how God designed marriage. And that does mean that your marriage is always preaching something. When you're a husband, the way you treat your wife is preaching about Jesus Christ. And it may be a good sermon, it may be a horrible sermon, but it's a sermon about Jesus. And so the way you relate to her is displaying something about the way Christ relates to his church. And it may be a big fat lie. You may be preaching Christ relates to his church like a jerk. He's mean, he's inconsiderate, he's rude, but that's your sermon, okay? Um, wasn't a very good one. When a wife is a nag or a pain in the neck or, or refuses to honor her husband at all, she's saying, this is the way the church relates to Christ. Bad sermon, but it's still being preached. On the other hand, when you're loving your wife and cherishing um, her and giving yourself up for her and trying to bless her in various ways, then you're preaching a bit better sermon. You're saying this is how Christ relates to his church. And when a woman lovingly cherishes her husband and honors him, she's saying this is the way the church honors Christ. So we're always providing a, marriage, a portrait of Christ through our marriages. We're always preaching a sermon about Christ in the church through our marriages. And so we need to ask, is it a good sermon or a bad one that we're preaching? Is it a beautiful picture or a really big mess? You know, one of those modern art splatters. <laughs> that's, I hate to be rude to modern art, but you know one of those splatter deals? That's, that's maybe the portrait that, you know, your, your marriage is, is preaching of Christ and his church. Headship is not, you know, just to, I'll take some stuff from Sam Storms in his book on Colossians when he's talking about headship. Um, headship, when it's speaking of the husband being ahead of the wife, is not being superior and having more worth or wisdom than your wife. It's not bullying or forcing your wife to submit. It's not being independent of God's authority or the authority of the church and the government. Because sometimes uh, a man who likes to be in charge thinks he's in charge of the family and in charge of the marriage, but the guy never met any other authority he liked or respected. Um, not God's authority, not the authority of the government, not the authority of the church. So if you're big on authority when you're the husband, but you don't honor other authorities, you've badly misunderstood these things. Headship's not ignoring your wife's wishes and her wisdom. It's not insisting on your own way. It's not making every decision being a control freak and never delegating. Uh, I make every decision at all times and I control everything that happens in this marriage because I'm the head of the marriage. Well, congratulations, but you misunderstood it completely. Headship is self-sacrificing love that pictures the self-sacrificing head of the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's gently providing and caring for your wife. It's protecting and empowering your wife to flourish. 
in beauty, in joy, in holiness, in using her talents and abilities. Part of being the head of an operation is to make sure everybody thrives and flourishes in the position that they're in. It's being considerate of your wife's wishes, considerate of her weaknesses, considerate of her strengths. And it is taking the lead by your example and by your actions. It's making tough decisions and taking responsibility for the consequences. And one of the decisions that a husband often might make is to leave it to my wife. Say, hey, that's her area. That's something she's really good at. Um, I'll let her make the decisions on that. But then when you do that, you don't come back later and say, you made the wrong decision. It's your fault. It was your decision to leave the decision to her. Okay? So then you, you take responsibility for the overall consequences because as you work together, that was the conclusion you reached. So you live with that. And sometimes there's a bit of a division of authority. I know when I talk to my mom on the phone, sometimes she'll say, well, you know, Dad and I, we never fought. Well, um, you know, I, that's a very charitable <laughs> memory of their relationship. They never fought, I guess. You know, they never duked it out or anything. But they, they dis she said, we sometimes disagreed. <laughs> but, but she says, you know, one of the things that made it work was he was in charge of the outside and I was in charge of the inside. That was kind of an oversimplification, but, you know, dad ran the farm and she did a lot of running the things in the house. And so sometimes different marriages have kind of different um, areas of territory where the two of you have agreed that, hey, here's kind of how things are going to work. And so it does work. But when you're the head of a situation, you still have to take responsibility for the final outcomes and consequences. Submission is not regarding the husband as smarter or better or worth more than the wife. In any, any relationship, and this is not an authority relationship in quite the same way that government is, but even in government, a president who thinks he is smarter than his whole cabinet in every area is a very foolish president because the whole reason he has his cabinet is because some of them know more about their area. The Secretary of the Treasury really ought to know more about finance than the President does. The Secretary of State is staying on top of a lot of different things that the President can't be bothered with the details of. And the very reason you have those people is so that you have super smart people working for you. Sometimes the head of a situation might be a decent manager, but he's actually managing people who are smarter than he or she is. And so in a relationship, just because somebody has a certain position does not mean that they're smarter or better or worth more. Um, going along with your husband's cruelty and pretending that his sin is okay is not what is meant by submission. If he's wrong, he's wrong. Uh, you remember maybe the story in the Bible of Abigail. She was married to a nitwit. I'm not being rude. His name meant nitwit. Uh, you know, his name was Nabal, which means fool. And she was married to this guy, and he was a very rude person. He happened to have a lot of money, and sometimes when you have money, you think you're better than you are. And he was very rude. But anyway, King David, and he was, David wasn't king yet. He was on the run with his men, and he had been helping out and looking out for Nabal's flocks and his people. And then he asked Nabal for some food. And Nabal responded very, very rudely and with a very harsh no. And so David says, well, I think I'll just kill them all. I'll just wipe him out. I'll wipe out his whole household. Well, Nabal had a very wise wife named Abigail who didn't want her household wiped out just because her husband was a moron. So she went to King David and brought with her lots of gifts and lots of food and lots of good things. And David said, whew, I'm glad you came because I would have had a lot of blood on my hands today. And it would have been stupid on my part, but at least you came. But you see the point. Her husband was a fool, but she didn't let his folly destroy her and her whole household. She took the steps that were necessary. And so sometimes submission does not mean, hey, I see that he's going to wreck everything, but I'm going along for the ride. You know, I'm just going to go right over the cliff with him. Sometimes you have to take steps to rescue your family and yourself um, if your husband is being cruel and wicked. And submission is not disobeying God to obey your husband. I've known situations where somebody said, well, my husband says I shouldn't go to church and I need to submit to my husband. Well, the guy is telling you to disobey God. He's telling you not to go worship God with his people. So you don't obey him. That, 
That's like having a government that tells you you can't follow Christ or worship God. Normally, when government is giving good instruction, you honor the government and obey it. When the government is being wicked and suppressing the true worship of the true God, you disobey the government. And so it is in family life. If, if a husband is being wicked and commanding wicked things, you can't go along with it. Submission is not being passive and stifling your creativity. It's not keeping quiet and never questioning or never criticizing or never advising your husband. You're a person. He's a person. You need interaction. You're both going to be better for it if you're paying attention to each other's wisdom and advice. Submission is not doing nothing without first getting your husband's permission and doing nothing beyond the confines of the home. Uh, certain cultural situations, certain people's patterns growing up lead them to think the Bible means this or that by submission. But the, we're talking about what the Bible doesn't mean by those things. What does it mean? Well, it means submitting to Jesus and picturing the church's submission to her Savior Submission is wanting to honor the husband's authority and embrace his leadership, and it's supporting your husband to help him reach his potential as a man of God. So you're, you're helping him, and you're supporting him, you're honoring him, and submission is compatible with thinking for yourself. When you get married, you don't hit the off switch on your brain and say, from now on, all thoughts I have will be thoughts directly transmitted to my brain from my husband. Submission is more effective than nagging if a husband needs to be won over from ungodly ways. If there are ways in which you can just honor him and go along with him in ways that aren't unlawful and you can love him, you may be able to win him over even if he's an ungodly man. And that submission comes then from the power of Christ. It's Christ living in you that helps you to live as the kind of wife that God calls you to be. The Bible says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. At the time Paul was writing, he was writing to people who were in a missionary situation. And when people came to Christ, that didn't mean their spouse always did. And so you might become a Christian, but your husband or wife wasn't. Now what? Paul did not say, divorce them, get rid of them. Paul said, love them and try to win them over. And so um, it's important to choose wisely when you're choosing a spouse, but maybe that choice was made before you were ever a believer. Or maybe that choice was made when you weren't thinking very clearly and weren't being very wise. What then? Well, you honor your spouse, and you keep praying that they'll be won over by your behavior, not by your brow beating, not by your saying, now, you have to become a Christian. You've got to go to church. You've got to do things my way. You show by your life that it's a wonderful and a desirable thing to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and you just might win them over by the help of God and by the help of the Holy Spirit. If you aren't walking in the way of Christ, um, you're harming your home, but you're also harming yourself. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. A man who strays from home is like a bird that strays from its nest. On the other hand, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it. So the apostle there is saying, if you're not treating your spouse well, you're really being kind of dumb because you're treating your own body in a certain way. So you, you want to care for yourself, love and care for your spouse, and you're going to flourish as a result. So one relationship is that relationship of parents, um, of husband and wife. Another within the family is parents and children. And we're called to be good parents. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's not a 100% guarantee. It's a proverb. And Proverbs tell you what usually happens. They don't say, if you're a good parent, your children will always turn out well. It's giving a generalization of how things go most of the time. And so train up the child in the way he should go, and usually when he's old, he won't depart from it. The Proverbs generalize in that way. It says, work hard, you're going to get richer. Don't work hard, you're going to get poorer. There are some people who don't work at all who get very rich. There are people who work very hard and stay poor. But most of the time, if you work hard, your wealth increases. So Proverbs gives you generalizations to kind of guide your choices in life. And here it's saying, train your kids right. 
Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So don't drive your kids crazy by being foolish and unreasonable and harsh, but instead bring them up to know God, discipline and instruction. And there's a big difference between proper training and just doubt, outright tyranny. When you're a tyrant, you're raging, you're insulting. Sometimes you're insulting your kids in front of other people. When you're rebuking, you're correcting them, not in a foul mood as you do it necessarily. And you're doing it more privately, not to shame them, but to help them get on a better track. When you're disciplining, it's fair. It's what they deserve. You're doing it in love, and it's limited. It's not just a way excessive punishment. When you're damaging, that involves bullying. Sometimes it involves bodily injury and abuse. These are the kinds of things that the Bible is talking about when it says, don't provoke them to wrath, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You're directing them by instruction, by your example, showing by the way you live, the way they ought to live. If you're telling them one thing and then doing the opposite, that is provoking your children to basically send the message, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, that's provoking them. So you're directing them by your instruction, by your example, and you're not dominating them by rigid control of everything they do. And that's important, especially as kids get older. Sometimes maybe when you're dealing with two-year-olds, you run it a little bit like a totalitarian police state <laughs> where you, know, you call all the shots, um, you're in charge, you have to give instant consequences. But if you try to raise 16-year-olds um, and deal with them the same way you did as you, when they were six, it will have calamitous consequences because they're being formed now to be more and more a person who thinks and acts on their own. And so dominating by just rigid control of every aspect of their lives, at some point you're going to have to give them some space to make their own choices. And at the same time, by your instruction and by your example, you can help them along with those choices. The Bible tells us that we're blessed by following good parents. In the Ten Commandments, it says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Normally, if you have good parents and you honor them, you're going to flourish. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. What happens when you have good parents and you choose to go a different way? Well, Proverbs says, The eye that mocks a father that scorns obedience to a mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. That's the Proverbs way of saying, dishonor good parents and you're dead meat. Because when the vultures and the ravens are picking out your eyes, it means you're dead meat. Okay? So that's the modern translation. But on the other hand, you know, you need to follow the wisdom of good parents. But what about bad parents? Well, the Bible takes account of that. There are some parents who are poison. Do not be like your fathers. They did not pay attention to me. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. And the scripture says you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. You're rescued from your parents and that family heritage. Now I know that's not maybe even politically correct, and it doesn't sound like the thing that churchy people ought to say, but sometimes you need to be rescued from what your family was like and the impression they made on you. And sometimes, even if you had overall good parents, you need to be rescued from some bad habits you picked up from them or from some rotten ways of thinking. Let's say, for instance, that you had parents who treated you well, and they brought you up to work hard, and um, they brought you to church, and they were racist. Okay, you got to sort through it. Because if they were racist, you got to reject the racism, but adopt the good things you learned about hard work and, and other things. Um, and, and I could give a lot of examples. I won't trot out a whole bunch of different ones. But, but you get the point that we need to be kind of selective in dealing with our family heritage because we picked up some great... Sometimes, some of you had uh, parents or families who had really no Christian heritage at all. They didn't believe in the Lord. They didn't walk with Him. You still may have picked up some good things from them. You can be grateful for those good things. You can love them and honor them, but you don't have to follow everything that they did or taught. And another thing the Bible shows us that's very, very important is family is not 
destiny. Family has an enormous impact. We need to be aware of that impact so that if it's good, we can continue it. If it's bad, we can stop it. But family is not destiny. So don't blame dad for how you turn out. Don't blame mom for who you are now. They have a huge impact, but you are responsible for you. You will not go to heaven hanging on to mom's apron strings or dad's coattails. Dad and mom can show you the way, but you must trust Christ yourself and walk that way yourself or you will not get there. On the other hand, if mom or dad were leading you down wrong paths, don't say, oh, mom and dad made me do it. I can't help it. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18 that we are each responsible for ourselves. It says if there is a righteous man and he does what's right and pleasing to God and he has a son and that son chooses to be a wicked person and to do what is wrong, he will not live because his father was good. He will surely die. But if there is a wicked man whose son sees what his father did and goes a different path and chooses what is right and good, he will not die because his father was wicked. He will surely live. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. When you read in the book of Kings in the Bible, you read of a godly king named Jotham. Great king did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And then he had a son named Ahaz, who sometimes sacrificed and murdered his own children to gods who were false and did many evil things. And then this rotter Ahaz had a child named Hezekiah, who was one of the greatest and godliest kings that Judah ever had. And Hezekiah had a kid named Manasseh who was so horrible that the streets of Jerusalem flowed with blood while he worshipped all kinds of false gods and goddesses. Now each of those kings was responsible for the kind of person he became. And one little footnote to Manasseh. He had that god, that godly father. He became so horrible and God allowed his country to be conquered and he was led off with a hook in his nose to a dungeon. And the Bible says while he was in the dungeon, he remembered the God of his father. And he repented and prayed and he was rescued from the dungeon and restored to his throne. So also keep that in mind. Family's not destiny. And if you had godly parents and you've gone far astray and rejected the God of your father and mother and you find yourself with a hook in your nose sitting in a dungeon, then it's time to re-examine your ways and say, I think maybe dad had something there. So family's not destiny, but if you had a godly family, you can sure learn some lessons from them. And if you've gone down a road far from the road that leads to God and to heaven, it's not too late to turn around. Flourishing families is what we want to have when we're relationally fit. Children's children, your grandchildren are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. So it is a great gift from God when families flourish, when they bring joy to each other, when grandkids bring joy to their grandparents, when kids can look back and say, you know what, I think mom and dad's IQ has gone up a few years since I was a teenager. You know, I think maybe they knew something after all. I, I kinda, I'm kind of proud of them. That, you know, there's something wonderful when family members really appreciate and enjoy each other. So, evaluate your family ties. The impact that husband and wife are having on each other, the impact that parents are having on children, the impact that you're having on your brothers and sisters. Say, am I helping them or am I hurting them? Am I making them better or worse? And how are they impacting me? Relationships do have a huge impact, and at the same time, take responsibility for who you are and the way you're influencing other people. And then evaluate friendships in much the same way. Evaluate your friends' impact on you. Are your friends helping or harming you? Are they making you better or worse? 
failure to ask that question proves to be the downfall of many people. Kids growing up who just kind of go with the flow of their friends often end up in major trouble. People who get in trouble with the law or who've been to prison, if they don't find a better group of friends and, of course, behave better themselves, find themselves just repeating the same old, same old. And what's your impact on your friends? Don't just say, oh, you know, sometimes we who are parents say, you know, if only my precious little Johnny had different friends, all would be well. Yeah. And what's Johnny doing for the friends? You know, there's a reason they're hanging together. They all want to be rotters together. So don't think that one kid is the pure prince who's being led astray by all those rotters that he happens, just happens to be hanging out with. Why is he hanging out with them? So you got to ask not just what impact are they having on me, but am I helping or harming my friends? Am I making them better people or worse persons? The impact of friends is described often in Proverbs. Here's just a few examples. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. If you go back to the writings in the book of Samuel, you, it's about David and his family. And when you read about David, you also read about his friendship, one of the great friendships of the Bible that David and Jonathan had. And David and Jonathan were so close, they, they were knit together in heart, they loved each other as brothers, even closer than brothers. And the Bible says that when Jonathan's father Saul was trying to kill David, Jonathan stayed faithful to David as his friend. And at one time when David was really being hunted and hounded and was far from everybody, it says, Jonathan went to him and he gave him strength in the Lord. That, friend, that phrase kind of covers it all of what a great friend is. He sticks with you when times are tough and strengthens you in the Lord. Do you have friends like that who, when times are hard, they strengthen you? They make you stronger in the Lord. There is another kind of friend, and that's also described in 2 Samuel. There was a guy named Jonadab. He was a friend. The Bible says that David's son Amnon had a friend named Jonadab. Here's the kind of friend he was. Amnon got the hots for his half-sister. She was a gorgeous woman named Tamar, and he wanted her. And he wanted her bad. And so he talked one day to his friend Jonadab, and Jonadab said, hey, what's getting you down? You're not looking so happy. And Amnon says, well, I, I want Tamar and I can't have her. And Jonadab says, hey, no problem. Here's what you do. You act like you're sick. And you know how your dad kind of spoils you anyway? Well, act like you're sick and say that you want your sister Tamar to bring you the food in the room by herself. And when she does, she's yours. So, Amnon does it. He acts like he's sick. Tamar is sent in with the food, and he grabs her and rapes her. And not that long after, Amnon is dead because Tamar's brother Absalom just waited and waited and pounced and killed him. So that's what Jonadab, that good friend, did for his friend. He said, you want something? Here's how you get it. What if instead he'd said, you want your half-sister? Brother, that, that is crazy. You got you to gotta back off of that idea and get her out of your head. But instead he says, here's how you get her if you want her. You can find friends like that. Maybe it won't be quite as extreme a uh, case as here's how to lay a trap and rape somebody. But there's friends who are just about that bad. They will help you get what you want, and they will help you pursue your worst urges and your most vile tendencies. If you already have a drinking problem, they will help you to drink more. If you already have a drug problem, they will sell the drugs to you or take them with you. Um, if you have uh, all kinds of different difficulties, they will lead you right down the path and accompany you down that path if that's where you want to go anyway. So, ask about the impact of your friends, the ones who give you good advice or the ones who lead you astray, the ones who help you become wise or the ones who lead you into harm 
into harming others as well as harming yourself. My son, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. That's part of a long speech in Proverbs 1 that says don't join a gang. It says there's these gangs out there. They want to hurt people. They want to grab what they've got. Don't join the gang. Stay away from a fool, for you won't find knowledge on their lips. Don't make friends with a hot-tempered man, or he may rub off on you. You may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. So you know that if you're hanging around with the wrong kind of people, they're likely to rub off on you. Now, that doesn't mean that you would never um, hang with anybody who had any fault, because otherwise you would be alone in the world, of course, and nobody would hang out with you either. But overall, what's their impact on you? And which direction is the impact working? Jesus hung out with prostitutes and sinners. Why would you hang out with prostitutes and sinners? There's uh, two reasons to hang out with prostitutes, and one of them isn't very good. You know, there's two reasons to hang out with sinners, and one of them is not very good. One is because you like their company and want to go along with what they're doing. The other is that you want to help them and rescue them. If you're there as a missionary, if you're there as someone to help them out of their wickedness, that's one thing. If you like hanging out with wickedness, that's quite a different thing. And again, as I said, if you're getting out of prison, you need to avoid the people who helped get you there in the first place, who cheered you on on your way to disaster. When you have a good friend, they will speak to you and sometimes they'll say things you enjoy and sometimes they won't. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. A true friend will sometimes tell you where you need to be corrected. They don't flatter. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. They're always kissing up, but they will not actually help you when you need to be corrected. The sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And sometimes sparks fly a little bit when that happens, but the end result is when true friends are helping each other, they sharpen each other. So be grateful when you have true and good advice from a friend rather than resenting, I thought you were my friend, you're supposed to be on my side. Well, they are on your side uh, when they're a true friend, but being on somebody's side does not always mean going along with their worst tendencies. And when you have a close friend, never abandon a friend, either yours or your father's. When disaster strikes, you won't have to ask your brother for assistance. It's better to go to a neighbor than to a brother who lives far away. Sometimes you have family who's geographically far away, and it's mighty nice to have friends who are there for you. In the first church that I served, um, Wendy was in the hospital for weeks on end with our first babies. Um, and then when the twins were born, they were in the hospital for months and months on end. And all of our family were 2,000 miles, uh, all of my family at least, were 2,000 miles away. And Wendy's family was a little closer, but still a ways away. And so friends were people who were supporting and encouraging and were right there. And so that's true of geographical distance, but sometimes you also have people who are close to you in the Lord and in your relationships, and your family just isn't close to you in the same way. They don't share your faith. And there, too, it's, important, it's better to have a close friend than to have a family who's at a distance from you spiritually. That doesn't mean you reject your family, but friendship matters. And that's important to realize, too. I've sometimes... Uh, met people who rediscovered the importance of family. Some of them got into home education, or even if they didn't, they really got excited about the importance of family. And I'm going to try to be a better father. I'm going to try to be a better mother. And family really matters a lot. And you know what? The thing that goes wrong with kids is they have friends. They have friends. Oh, the horror of it. If only they stuck exclusively with their wise, gentle, and caring father and mother and had no friends, they would walk the right path. Well now, family does matter a lot, but so do friends. And some who have thought that way also, who rediscovered the importance of family, said, family is enormously important, but church? Well, that's optional. In fact, we'll make our family a church. That's good enough. I'm now the pastor. I'm dad, I'm the pastor. And we will have our own church as our own household, and that's that. And that has often been a recipe for disaster. Because again, rediscovering the importance of family is wonderful, but thinking that now that wipes out the value of friendship and non-family ties is a catastrophic error. It's a, 
It's going to an extreme and ignoring what the Bible teaches about the importance of friendship as well as family, of church family and not just biological family. So again, uh, be faithful in your friendships and realize that sometimes a close friend, close geographically, close spiritually, can do more for you than your family can. You know, I, in our family, we've, I'm close to my family. My parents have been a great blessing to us, but I also do have a few kids named after my friends because our friends have been a tremendous blessing in our lives. And when you have a friendship like that, you guard it. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Don't let a gossip divide you from, well, I heard what your friend said. You know, just if somebody's your friend, don't listen to everything that's said about them. Don't let strife separate the friendships that you have. And at the same time, realize, as we've seen in a previous talk, um, forgiveness is the key to keeping family and friend friend relationships alive. Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. So don't keep on dwelling on the clashes that you might have had. Forgive them, move on, enjoy the relationships that God gives you. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and that statement, of course, always brings to mind for those of us who are Christians, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not ashamed to call us brothers, but also not ashamed to call us his friends. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I've made known to you. That's a tremendous statement, isn't it? That Jesus doesn't just say, now, you're the sinners that I came to rescue, you are the bad people that I came to forgive. Those are true statements, and we can be thankful that he did those things, but what a blessing it is when he looks you in the eye and says, I don't just call you a servant anymore. I call you my friend. And I lay down my life for my friend, and you have never had a friend like that who will go that far. And so that is the ultimate in friendship, just as God is the ultimate in fatherhood. The ultimate in family is God the Father in relationship to his son, and then God in relationship to us. And family flows out of that. And so evaluate family, evaluate your friendships. Ask again this morning as we're launching into a new year, um, who am I hanging out with? Why am I hanging out with them? Are they helping me? Are they harming me? Are they making me a better person and more like Jesus? Or are they making me a worse person and less like Jesus? And then what's my impact on my friends? Am I helping or harming them? Am I helping them to be better or worse? Um, evaluate those things and then act accordingly. Bible teaches us that all relationships, if you're a believer, flow out of your relationship to Christ and reflect something about Christ. Jesus lives in you, so you display his life in your relationships. And that starts at home. That starts in the way you relate to those closest to you. And it starts also in your relationships with your friends. And then you can go on from there to love enemies, to love neighbors, those who are at a distance from you. But if Christ lives in you, let it flow in the family and friendships that you have. And if Christ is living in your family members, if he's living in your friends, then you want to nurture Christ in them to see what Jesus is doing, to see signs of the Christ life in them, and to encourage it, to compliment that, to praise it, and to keep encouraging them to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember this, your life is always preaching a sermon. Each family role that you're in, each friendship you have is saying something about Jesus Christ. Are you the kind of friend where people say, he would do anything for me. She would lay down her life for me. Are you the kind of husband or wife who will sacrifice or submit your own interests to bless the partner that God has given you? In your parent-child relationship, do you look to God the Father as your model for fatherhood or for being a parent, a mother to your children? Do you 
If you're a son or a daughter, you say, Jesus, I want to have my sonship or my, my relationship with child to parent be like the relationship Jesus had, admiring and loving his father and doing the will of his father. You realize that's what it's all about, don't you? Don't go through life thinking, well, friendships are here, family is this, work is that, and so on, where we've got a, a zillion different compartments of life that are not connected. It's all connected. And it's all meant to express the Christ life that God has given you. And so may God give us the grace to do just that. Dear Lord, center our lives on our Lord Jesus Christ. By the reality of the Holy Spirit living in us, may we overflow with the love of Christ for those around us, that in our family relationships and in our friendships, the reality of God and the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit will be evident in all we are and in all we do. For Jesus' sake, amen.